When a man becomes a father And a woman has a child of her own They share a trust they must remember That it's not theirs, not theirs alone The gift they share is from Jehovah yes, yes, Of life and love, he is the yeah. one true source to parents he gives should direction so I will do that they a, may follow the wise a sacred trust you have been given a precious life is in your hands you can bestow the greatest favor instruct your child in God's commands God has commanded They must always prove to be on your heart These words shall speak to sons and daughters This is your trust, this is your part To them you'll speak along your roadway When you rise up and when you are at rest In years to come Sacred trust, you have been given. A precious life is in your hands. You can bestow the greatest favor. Instruct your child in God's commands.
Once it seemed I only dreamed that you'd be in my warm embrace Waiting round the corner is a world I long to see It's a promise from Jehovah It's a guarantee reality And it's hard to get downhearted When I think of what's in store It's the day I'm waiting for And it's just around the corner See how God these things 
Well, we extend a warm welcome to everyone. We are so happy you were able to join with us today. And uh, what we have just watched are just a few of the memories that Mike attained during a life of over nine decades. The slideshow video in its entirety will be shown at the conclusion of today's program. Uh, no doubt as you watched it, you too enjoy looking back in time with us and I'm sure it brought back many personal memories of Mike and the family, memories of your own. Now, before we begin, there are just a few announcements we were asked to, to share with you. First, as much as we would love for everyone to be able to speak with the family and uh, with one another, uh, the sound during the program will be muted for the entire program. To download a copy of the program containing a summary of Mike's life story, and there are several ways. Uh, first, you can open the chat feature right here in the Zoom uh, meeting. Click on the link in the chat. You can also use the website link given in the waiting room or on the picture shown earlier. And this QR code that you see on the screen right now can also be used. And finally, the family asks if, if possible, if you could add your first and last name using the rename feature in Zoom, it would be so much appreciated. Well, we're going to open by singing a song that's so appropriate. Uh, song number 39, entitled, Make a Good Name with God. The lyrics will appear on the screen if you'd like to sing along. And then afterward, a longtime friend, faithful servant of Jehovah, Brother Ray Richardson, will represent us in a word of prayer to start our program. First, make a good name with God. To make a Once again, we welcome all in attendance to today's program. Let's now give our attention to Brother Gerald Samoth, a longtime friend of Mike. He's going to deliver our funeral discourse. So let's now give our attention to Brother Samoth. We have come to remember and reflect on a life well lived. The name on his birth certificate was Michael Glida. To his beloved wife, Joan, he was Mike and affectionately daddy. To his daughters, Joan and Michelle, he was dad or pops. To his spiritual brothers and sisters, he was brother Glida. To the young ones, he was always uncle Mike or grandpa Mike. To his business associates, he was Mr. Glida. But to everyone who his life touched, 
he was a friend. And most important to the God of the Bible, whose name is Jehovah, Michael Glida held the most important title anyone on the planet Earth could hold. Michael was one of Jehovah's Witnesses. This afternoon, we want to tell the story of Michael Glida, who was survived by his loving and supportive wife, Joan. Their two daughters and their husbands, Michelle and her husband, Ramon Navarro Jr. and Joan and her husband, Jim Kittress. He is also survived by his sister-in-law, Helen Kovalak, and his niece, Tamar Kovalak. He is predeceased by his brother and sister-in-law, Nicholas and Laverne Kovalak Jr. and his brother, Mickey Kovalak. On March 20th, 1928, Michael Glida was born and he fell asleep in death on November 23rd, 2020. As we saw in the video, a slideshow just before and on the invitation, those dates were separated by a dash. That dash is the story of his life. It's a beautiful story of a man who loved his God, a man who loved his family, and a man who loved everyone who his life to touched. And like most stories, his story begins with the familiar words, once upon a time. So let's go back once upon a time to 1928 in Passaic, New Jersey. Mike was born in a cold water flat on Third Street, delivered by a midwife to Nicholas and Mary Glida. His dad, Nicholas, died in 1937 of tuberculosis when Mike was only nine years old. Mike helped his mother by shining shoes for five cents a pair with a shoe box that was made by a family member. And his mom, Mary, affectionately known as Baba, remarried Nicholas Kovalak Sr. in 1942, and the family moved to 107 Viola Avenue in Clifton. A very close family relationship immediately developed, and his new brother, Nick Jr., took Mike under his wing, not just as an older brother, but he became his Bible teacher. Mike started his public ministry in August 1942, and there was no turning back. He faithfully shared every month till his death last month in November 2020. As Mike learned from the Bible, he enthusiastically shared what he was learning, things that opened his eyes as his brother Nick Jr. taught him. One, that the God of the Bible had a glorious name, Jehovah that those asleep in his death, like his birth dad, have a hope of a resurrection to be brought back to life. That World War II, which was raging at that time, was a sign of the last days that the Bible prophesied in Matthew 24. And he learned that the promise of God's kingdom would bring an end to everything harmful and hurtful. Mike was delighted to learn these things and to share them with anyone who would listen. Mike was baptized just a few months later as one of Jehovah's Witnesses in December, 1942. And at just a few years later in 1945, at the age of 17, he was giving one hour Bible lectures at the Kingdom Hall in Passaic that was on Lexington and Lexington Avenue, close to the main avenue railroad tracks. Now, if you're familiar with the area, say what railroad tracks? Well, in the 1920s, 30s and 40s, there was a railroad that ran between Buffalo, New York and Jersey City. And sometimes when Mike or others were giving a talk and a big train came through, they had to pause to let the train depart. He gave talks, he shared actively in these weekly meetings, as well as sharing the Bible's message of hope to all in the Clifton Passaic area who would listen. These were busy and happy years and the time moved by very quickly. Three times a year, Mike attended larger conventions of Jehovah's Witnesses, and he enjoyed them because it helped him to become more effective as a minister and a teacher of God's word. And at one of those conventions, he met somebody very special. It was in 1951 at a circuit assembly in Elizabeth, New Jersey, that he met Joan DeWeese. They dated, their first date was to a dinner and movie at Radio City Music Hall in New York City. And not long after, in May of 1955, they were married. A year later, Mike and his beloved wife, Joan, welcomed their twin daughters, Joan and Michelle, 
who we affectionately known as Joni and Mickey. The busy years of raising a family followed. Mike supported his family by working at Becton Dickinson. The Gleedas were known for their love and care of their family and the congregation, and this would define them for the decades to come. Love and hospitality were as natural to them as blooming flowers in the springtime. Both Mike and Joan cared for their moms when they took ill until they fell asleep in death, uh, each when each of their moms took ill. And as a team, as a husband and wife, they took care of many widows and orphans in their tribulation, always trying to be of support and encouragement. Time would fail us if we mention all that were shown loving hospitality, including traveling representatives of Jehovah's Witnesses, such as Russell and Dottie McPhee and Chuck and Ellie Valores, who called the Glida home their home when they made periodic visits to the congregations in the area during the 1970s and during the 1980s. Their home was open to everyone. And during large conventions at Yankee Stadium, like the one in 1958 that spanned seven days, 27 persons stayed at the Glida home. Breakfast and dinner was served every day before going to Yankee Stadium in the Bronx and then coming back. What hospitality. Jack and Betsy Balnave share a similar story with the contingent that they brought from Iowa in the 1970s and had no place to stay. The Gleedas, Mike, took the lead of being hospitable. And during this time, Mike did not miss a heartbeat in serving as an elder in the Passaic congregation, sharing the good news about God's kingdom with his family every week and being there for anyone who needed any type of help, whether spiritually or materially. As we continue to tell the story of Mike Lita, let's fast forward a little bit to the vantage point of 1970, because some notable, notable events took place around that year that would shape the next 50 years. Here are just a few of them. Mike bought his first apartment buildings about that time in 1970, and it became the family's source of income. Mike retired from Becton Dickinson to pursue managing apartment buildings full time, which he enjoyed very, very much. He had very good business sense that allowed him to employ family, friends, and others. And he was in a position to generously share with others, offering both employment and help to many who enabled them to pursue spiritual goals while working for him. He invested wisely. He was discreet in using the unrighteous riches that he had to help many. Their family grew. In 1979, Joni married Jim. And in 1984, Michelle married Ramon. Mike and Joan now had two sons whom they loved and still love very dearly. His family always brought him great joy. Well, what were some things in Mike's life that were some of his favorite things? We might remember a popular song. These are a few of my favorite things. If you made a list of Mike's favorite things, what would they include? Well, swimming at the Jersey Shore, going out in his small boat, traveling to the Western United States and Hawaii, as we saw in the uh, slideshow, singing with the bellowing voice of Mike Lita that we all know and remember we can hear it now in our, in our ears. He loved to play pool and swimming in his pool. What was his favorite food? Would it surprise you to know it was blueberry cream pie? And would you be surprised to know that he loved doing Sudoku puzzles? Anything that was mentally challenging was something that Mike really enjoyed doing. He also enjoyed playing 500 rummy with Joan. And as we saw, a nice dinner at the manor was something that he enjoyed with his family and others who he shared his hospitality and graciousness with. A constant in his life was always working hard for the God who he knew and loved, whose name is Jehovah. It allowed him to share in various projects that brought him immense joy. 
Amongst these were one building Tent City back in 1953. This was an arrangement back in um, near Plainfield, New Jersey, where thousands commuted to Yankee Stadium. It provided a place, sanitation, and what, everything that was needed. He worked on the renovation of the Stanley Theater that became the Jersey City Assembly Hall from 1983 to 1985. Mike served as a member of the hospital liaison committee in the early 1990s and for many years of this after, thereafter, which allowed him to help his brothers and sisters obtain non-blood man medical management. And he provided help and support to an international project that detailed how Jehovah's Witnesses maintained neutrality during World War II in Jersey. Brother Ray Richardson, in Germany that was, and Brother Ray Richardson, a close friend of Michael Glita who opened our program with prayer, will now share and explore how Mike helped so many as he participated on these projects. Brother Richardson, I think just need to unmute yourself and we're looking forward to hearing your comments. Okay. Mike Lita was a genuine son of comfort and a son of encouragement. In the Bible, this expression, son of, was sometimes used to indicate a prominent quality that distinguishes a person. For instance, in Acts, it mentions Barnabas that he was given by the apostles a surname of son of comfort. He was an outstanding ability to encourage and comfort others. Well, Mike was just like this. When he saw a fellow Christian struggling with severe physical or mental distress, he would reach out and help such ones. He was always willing to show compassion and empathy. As an example, of his comfort and encouragement, he did something that I will never forget. It was some years ago, I was having a very difficult time with a writing assignment. Well, after two weeks of work to try to prove a certain point, I realized the point was a dead end. It just couldn't be used. Well, I was very discouraged, distressed, to the point of actually shedding some tears over the frustration. But guess who called? Mike. He just wanted to know how I was doing, but he could sense how dear, how down I was. And he didn't know what was the assignment since that was confidential. So he could not fully understand my frustration, but he shared some beautiful and encouraging words that touched my heart. It meant so much. So I got over the discouragement. I pushed forward successfully for the assignment. He was a real son of comfort and encouragement. But Mike did more than just give comfort or encouraging words. He reminds me of Barnabas during the infancy of uh, Christianity a large group gathered in Jerusalem. And so there was a need for them to uh, uh, contribute to feed this crowd. The scriptural account says that Barnabas owned a piece of land and he sold it and brought the money and deposited it at the feet of the apostles. Well, now this donation uh, by Barnabas was for the advancement of the Christian work. Well, warm-hearted Mike was a generous person. He didn't hesitate to offer both himself and his possessions because he wanted to uh, support in any way for the advancement of kingdom interest. Well, now, when our department was moving from Brooklyn to Patterson, New York, Part of the writing room or the writing department and translation services department moved up to Patterson. But I soon realized 
there was no access to the local libraries that we used for research in New York City. Now, especially among those uh, libraries they used was a very valuable set of, uh, of books that uh, were, I did a lot of research with and was called the Loeb Classical Library. Now, these little volumes of ancient historians and authors are very uh, valuable. They had uh, the original language on one page and the English translation on the next page. And I had used these extensively, but there were no libraries anywhere near Patterson where I could reach them. So how could I do the research that I needed to do for my work? And mind you, the set contained over 400 volumes. Mike came to the issue. He certainly wanted to see the advancement of kingdom interest. And out of his generosity, he provided the means to get all 400 volumes. Well, we put them in my personal library, but other researchers they would come from other departments and come to use them, to see them. Uh, it really brought a lot of uh, ability to uh, do research. One researcher, a sister, while she was using one of these volumes, she said, I don't know what we would do without these books. I really mean it. We would be lost without them, all because of the generosity of Mike. Another example of being a son of comfort was his intense efforts to encourage hospitals to practice bloodless medicine and uh, surgery. Well, he and some other brothers worked together and they were successful so that when one of Jehovah's Witnesses had serious uh, surgery due to Mike and others, they can find a hospital that practice bloodless medicine and it has very outstanding skills. Now, Mike personally helped many who had life-threatening illnesses. He did that with comforting visits, uh, comforting words, and he helped them to locate such hospitals. He worked closely with the United States Hospital Information Desk at the headquarters of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, Mickey asked me to tell that department that Mike had died. When I called, they all knew him well, and they were deeply grieved over the situation. There was one brother who worked for years with Mike to help individuals and work with the hospital staff. This brother said to me, if you could gather in one place all the persons who were comforted by Mike and that loved him, you would fill MetLife Stadium. Uh, you may know it holds over 82,000 people. Uh, perhaps a little significant uh, exaggeration, but the brother made a significant point, and I highly agree with him. Mike was a genuine son of comfort, and he will be sorely missed. Thank you so much, Brother Richardson, for those heartfelt comments and reflection. We'd like to continue Mike's story. And now for a moment, we'd like to talk about the impact that he had, not just on the congregation, which he was significant, but on family members. And I'd like to just share some comments that were received from family members, spiritual brothers and sisters about how they were encouraged and helped by Mike Lita. His nephew, Bill Deweese mentioned, Uncle Mike was very kind to me to take me into their home and have me live with them when I attended Montclair State College in the early 1970s. Bill comments, they had their own lives to live with their daughters, Mickey and Joni, but still made room for me. 
They gave me a space to live my life and they gave me guidance that lasted a lifetime. Three young men in the Pasea congregation going back to 1980, 40 years ago, these three young men were six years old at the time or about 60 years old. Now they're serving as missionary. One is a missionary in Africa. One is in a foreign language field in the United States. Another is serving at world headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses shared these reflections and recollections. Let's hear some comments from Paul DiMicino. Paul mentions, and again, these are when these brothers were about five, six or seven years old. Paul recalls, what I remember most about Brother Glida is the personal interest he showed me. Usually after the meeting, all us young ones played Kingdom Hall and we had many fine brothers and elders, but all of us wanted to be Brother Glida. Jeff Geffer said, he made me feel so special when he would ask my mom if it was okay for me to sit with him in the front row where he would be sitting every Wednesday night to conduct the theocratic ministry school. Micah Samoth mentioned, my favorite memory was waiting for Brother Glida to enter the kingdom hall. He would personally pick each one of us up and asked if we needed a spanking. Well, then he gave us an assignment and he, as he got ready to conduct the theocratic ministry, ministry school. For each of these young boys who grew to be fine men, husbands and elders, they mentioned that what Brother Glida, that while Brother Glida was very well to do, that never defined the man. Each of them commented what defined Brother Glida in their minds and hearts was his love for them as individuals and most importantly, his building a love for Jehovah in their young hearts. A few more recollections. Margaret Swed remembers his happy singing serenades in the morning, prayers at dinner time, playing cards, might be 500 rummy, experiences and stories from his early years serving Jehovah and how he enjoyed talking about how he proposed to Ann Joan. Paul Muller, who's now in Iowa, remembers when his dad, that's Paul Muller's dad, died in October 1960, 76, and that Mike and his wife Joan came over, brought us dinner on the first night after the viewing. They took us to the funeral and came to lighten the blow of seeing my dad at the funeral home. It's something I will never forget. He was a great advocate for our family during those turbulent years after my father's death. Mike was a father to the fatherless. And so many others had commented and wrote about the kindness and generosity of a man who was larger than life, but who humbly served as God and recognized his, his need to always show humility and listen. And he did that so well. And if I may add personally, my family and I have been personally enriched by our knowing Mike and Joan and Joni and Mickey and their husbands. We came to the Passaic area in 1976. Mike helped me to become a better public speaker. And as you can see, I'm still working on it. One of these days I'll get there. We worked together on regional convention programs. He taught me so much and I was able to share a little with him from time to time. We laughed together and at times we cried together. That's what spiritual brothers do. And I felt personally honored that on a few occasions, Mike asked me for help on some small projects. Mike seldom asked anyone for a favor. And I just felt honored and I am really beyond honored that the family felt confidence to ask me to deliver this memorial of a man who we all love. Before the formal program began, there was a photographic journey of Mike Lita's life that will be shown again if you missed it as our chairman pointed out. But as we watched it or as you'll watch it afterwards, you'll see a young boy grow up to be a fine Christian man, a husband, a father, a father-in-law and part of a marriage that flourished for 65 years. We then watch him age. We see him decline physically. Why? 
The answer to that question was something Mike enjoyed to and explaining to anyone who would listen to him, whether he was knocking on your door, sitting in your kitchen, conducting a Bible study, or leaving when he was talking with people at a laundromat or at a mall. He would share something that was written by the Jewish writer Paul in a letter that was written 2000 years ago to a congregation in Rome, Italy. It explains why we all grow old and die. If you have a Bible with you, you might wanna to turn to the book of Romans, the fifth chapter and verse 12, because in an economy of words, there was the answer and Mike would share that with any who would listen. That's the book of Romans, the fifth chapter and verse 12. It reads there. That is why just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because they had all sinned. The word sin originally comes from a Hebrew word which means to miss the mark. What was the mark that was missed? It was the mark of perfection, the mark of that Adam and Eve, our original parents, were designed to live forever. They were not designed to get old and sick and dying. It is explained in the first chapters of the Bible what happened. And Mike would enjoy to share that with all who would listen. He would point out that Jehovah, the God of the Bible, his purpose was for that Garden of Eden to expand. Adam and Eve were to cultivate it till east met west and north met south and the whole earth became a paradise. And that purpose has not changed. And Mike rejoiced when he learned that it would still happen by means of the kingdom arrangement and he would share that with you. But what really touched him and what he would really want to share and it really impacts our being together this afternoon is a truth that he learned that was written in the book of Isaiah, the 25th chapter in verse eight about the hope for the dead. Again, if you might turn your Bible, if you have it, or I'll just read it to you from Isaiah chapter 25 and verse eight. Speaking of the creator, it says at that verse, he will swallow up death forever and the sovereign Lord Jehovah will wipe away the tears from all faces. The reproach of his people he will take away from the earth for Jehovah himself has spoken it. It brought Mike great joy when he first learned that he would see his birth father, Nicholas Glida again, and that, that, that would be a benefit of God's kingdom that would bring about the resurrection. His face would light up when he spoke about these things. And I can see that broad smile now in my mind's eye. And I'm sure many of you can see that as well. Mike firmly believed what was written in the Bible at Job chapter 14, verses 14 and 15. That's the book of Job chapter 14, verses 14 and 15, because it again talked about the hope for someone who has fallen asleep in death. The verse reads there, if a man dies, can he live again? I will wait all the days of my compulsory service, that is, lying asleep in death, until my relief comes. You will call and I will answer you. You will long for the work of your hands. Mike was touched by that. And so while the grave reminds us of the brevity of life, this hope of the resurrection assures us of the brevity of death. The Bible likens death to sleep. And as surely as we wake up each day from our night's rest, so sure is the Bible's promise that those asleep in death will awaken. That is what our brother and our friend Mike Lita would want us to remember. That was the sure promise that gave him hope. That is the sure hope that fortifies his family. That is the sure hope that fortifies each of us. And that is the sure hope that he would share who, who, to anyone this was new information. Right before his death, Mike completed his autobiography. I want to read a brief excerpt from that to you, but listen what he says to his family. To my family, 
I want to pay a gigantic compliment to my wife, Joan, without whose tremendous help I could not accomplish all that I did. To this day, my wife and I still talk about our early years with pride and joy because we did so much in our service to Jehovah and to help our brothers as well. We also raised four spiritual children. I say four because I count my two sons, Ramon Navarro and Jim Kittress, as my children. All four reward us richly today because they took care, good care of us in our old age. We cannot believe that we are age 87 and me a young 92. Wow. We are truly fortunate to have four beautiful children. He goes on to say in this autobiography to my daughters, Joan and Michelle, the reason for my writing my life story is because you told me I have a rich spiritual heritage to share with our family and friends. Thank you. Aren't those touching words? For Mike Lita, having a family gave Mike something to do, someone to love, someone's to love, and something to hope for. Now, on behalf of all of us here this afternoon, we want to speak a moment to the family. Joan, thank you for sharing your husband with us. Joni and Mickey, thanks for sharing your dad with us. You have shown your kindness and generosity, and now it's our opportunity to comfort you at the time of your loss. And to each of you, Joan, Joni, Mickey, Jim, Ramon, the familiar words written 3,500 years ago are our prayer for you. I'm going to read this from the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. This is our feeling and our prayer for you. May Jehovah bless you and safeguard you. May Jehovah make his face shine upon you, and may he favor you. May Jehovah lift up his face toward you and grant you peace. So let's now return to our story, the story of Michael Glita. It's far from being over. The next chapters will soon be written when our dear brother awakens from sleep in the paradise earth Jehovah promised. That dash of what happened from March 20th, 1928 to November 23rd, 2020, tells the story of a man who loved his God, Jehovah, his family, his spiritual brothers, and everyone who he came in contact with. And it makes us think and reflect on the way we're living our lives. And as our story began with the familiar words, once upon a time, they will continue with the words, and he lived happily ever after. Why? Thanks to what is written at the book of Isaiah, chapter 25 and verse 9. We conclude by just thinking of those words, Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 9. In that day they will say, look, this is our God. We have hoped in him and he will save us. This is Jehovah. We have hoped in him. Let us be joyful and rejoice in the salvation by him. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much, Gerald. We certainly appreciate the fine thoughts you shared with us about Mike. My, we especially enjoyed hearing Mike's strong conviction about future life prospects for mankind right here on earth. He eagerly looked forward to them and he zealously shared them with everyone he could. Now, as we conclude, we'd like to invite everyone to join us in song. We're going to uh, sing a, a beautiful song followed by a closing prayer. And then we have just a final announcement on behalf of the family. If you'd like to sing along, the lyrics will be displayed on the screen. Let's sing together song 139, See Yourself When All Is New.
now give our attention as Brother Ramon Navarro concluding prayer. Brother Navarro. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you, Ramon. The uh, family asks that we make just a few final announcements. Um, first off, the family really wants to express their deepest appreciation for all of the love, the encouragement, the phone calls, the texts, the cards, all the support that's been shown. And they deeply appreciate your attendance here at the program today. If you'd like to share a special memory, maybe it's a story or even a photograph, please feel free to email the family so that they can enjoy them and reflect on them in the weeks and months to come. There, there's an email address in the chat feature of today's meeting that you can use for this purpose. Now, some have heard that uh, Mike has been working on his autobiography for the last couple of years. And if you'd like to have a digital copy, please email the family expressing your request. Uh, also, if you'd like to, to call the family members or reach out to them, uh, they would love to hear from as many as possible as time would allow. To download a copy of the program containing a summary of Mike's life story, uh, please go to the chat feature and click on the link. Um, if for some reason you're unable to download the program, feel free to request it using the email at the bottom uh, of the invitation. And then the, the YouTube link in the chat feature will also have today's program available for viewing uh, for uh, the next three months. Well, friends, this concludes the program. We thank you again for coming and giving support to the family and friends. And now we invite you to enjoy the 23 minute slideshow presentation with a special conclusion. Thank you.
to parents he gives sure direction that they may follow the wisest course. A sacred trust you have been given, a precious life is in your hands. You can bestow the greatest favor, instruct your child in God's commands. God has commanded They must always prove to be on your heart These words shall speak to sons and daughters This is your trust, this is your part To them you'll speak along your roadway When you rise up and when you are at rest In years to come sacred trust you have been given a precious life is in your hands you can bestow the greatest favor instruct your child in God's commands Yeah.
friends may dwell. Who gains your friendship? Who gains your trust? Who really knows you well? All who embrace your word, all who have faith in you.
can hear the songbirds singing And you watch the clouds roll by Then you're walking in the valley As the sun shines in a clear blue sky You're welcoming your loved ones And you can't believe your eyes Yes, this earthly paradise Was just around the corner There's a house down in the valley And a house high on the hill There is singing by the river As the water flows and turns the mill The golden fields are waiting Let the harvesting begin Once the world we're living in Was just around the corner It's great to share with friends who care The things that we looked forward to Now every tear has disappeared The world is young and life is new There's the sound of happy voices And the scent of new mown hay Now you're calling to your loved ones As you start another perfect day Then we thank our God Jehovah For his tender loving care Yes, the blessings we all share Were just around the corner And every day I smile and say How good to see your happy face Cause once it seemed I only dreamed that you'd be in my warm embrace Waiting round the corner Is a world I long to see It's a promise from Jehovah It's a guarantee reality And it's hard to get downhearted When I think of what's in store It's the day I'm waiting for And it's just around the corner
Don't forget to say your prayers, Mike. Yes, mommy. Okay. I love you. Not as much as I love you. Well, that's the way it should be. 